Welcome to the Safety Doc Podcast with your charismatic host and prominent safety expert, Dr. David Perodin. Be entertained and informed as the Safety Doc discusses both best and bizarre practices in safety preparation and crisis response. The truth will keep you safe. Follow Dr. Perodin on Twitter at SafetyPhD. Hi, everyone. This is David, and welcome to the Safety Doc Podcast. Today, I will be talking about Shattering Myths of Transference and Countertransference in Crisis Contexts. First off, thank you to Hector Solis of the Typical Daddy Podcast for last week's interview on the Safety Doc Podcast. I encourage you to visit typicaldaddy.com for the updated resources available to parents. Again, typicaldaddy.com. A thank you to economist Aaron Clary for agreeing to be interviewed on the Safety Doc podcast. I have worked with Aaron, who is the author of Reconnaissance Man, a book focused on helping a young person identify how to travel across the United States, conduct reconnaissance, find out places that he or she might want to live. And the book is invaluable for also identifying uh, the sense of agency, sense of purpose, uh, Aaron talks about, you know, the why of, of, of why that's important to do, especially, you know, think about it. If you're 18 years old and you love hiking, you love going up mountains, maybe Florida isn't the place for you because, you know, the highest mountain there, what, it's, I think it's like 400 feet. So he gets into relevant things like that and says, let's do this while you're young and, and lays out, lays out. Uh, very clear set of directions. Also then gets into some practical advice of saying, you know what? You don't need a huge bank account to go and do reconnaissance across the country. If you need to sleep in your vehicle, here's a way to take some, some mesh and some, and some duct tape and, uh, you know, crack that window down so you're not having condensation. And, and, you know, if you need to, to sleep in your car overnight to save a few dollars, um, once in a while on your trip, then here's how to do it. So by doing that, you know what he does is he takes down that barrier again. He doesn't he doesn't let your wallet get in 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 the way. Um, and finally, Aaron does go state by state, region by region, um, identifying and helping to prioritize of where you might want to start your reconnaissance. Thank you to John Grant and the 405 Media, the 405 Media dot com out of Los Angeles. This show airs 2 p.m. PST every day on the 405media.com. So let's get into today's show, Shattering Myths of Transference and Countertransference in Crisis Context. Does that sound intimidating, overwhelming? A little, a, a little bit, right? All right, let's, it, it does. But So let's break it down and let's use examples. And I promise you, it's going to make a lot of sense. It's going to be very relevant to everybody listening. It's going to, it's going to be relevant to you. Um, let's talk about first, what is transference? Transference, it's the emotional glue that binds people to a leader. So in, an, let's say it's a company, um, and, and, you know, you are, you know, you, you feel, um, committed to your boss or your, your department head. Um, that's transference that you're transferring this, this trust or this vesting into this, this person. Um, now, you know, that also can happen in a home. It can happen in, in social groups. You're, you're kind of transferring and, and, you know, this is, this is someone that you're going to, to follow that you are going to invest your, your trust into. And I'm going to talk about how that also just happens kind of, at an organizational level that's that's more nebulous it doesn't have a face to it um so it's very natural for transfer transference to happen um there can also be big pitfalls with transference because people can do it um and and, and this is the reason sometimes someone might work you know 80 hours a week um for for their boss and it's just because they they want the approval of their boss um maybe when they were growing up, they would get approval um, for putting in, you know, extra time on, on homework and extra time on assignments from a parent. They see the boss then um, subconsciously in kind of that parent role, and then they work hard to get that same type of praise. This happens actually quite a bit, folks. Positive transference, positive transference, um, and and especially for someone that has a lot of charisma. 
it's not necessarily how competent that person is, uh, whether it, it be a boss or a leader, but someone that has a lot of charisma that, again, you it, you are seeking validation um, from that, that person. And what it, it does then, and again, this can have positive effects, can have negative effects, but uh, you're investing into that person, investing your trust. So um, leaders can very easily come undone by their followers' positive transference projection. Remember the, what is it, the emperor or the king has no clothes, you know, it's like, you know, no one was willing to say anything because they didn't want to upset the emperor. Um, well, you know, another aspect of this is if all you're getting is is positive um, feedback from people, that people are enamored by, by what you're doing, enamored by, by working with you, um, you're not getting genuine feedback. You're just getting positive feedback and nothing to kind of help you keep that razor's edge. Um, and that's not what you want. I mean, you want people to give you feedback, uh, whether it be your friends or whether you want it to be your employees. So um, people that, that walk around, and sometimes you'll see this with athletes, you know, they're, they're reading the newspaper, they're watching what's on the sports highlights about them, and it's like, I am just like terrific, I'm awesome, I'm great. And in the moment they start to, to buy into all of that hype that is out there, which generally, you know, the people feel and they're packing the stadiums and whatever, um, you know, they they – can start to lose the edge on their game because like, well, I don't have to, to practice anymore. I'm like, I'm, I'm already there. All I got to do is show up, you know, just put the uniform on and, and the magic happens. So um, most, most good leaders though, most good leaders don't buy into their followers, idealized images of them. So they recognize it, but they don't buy into it. Most good leaders, but there are leaders who do have, you know, we talked about this positive transfer, but there are leaders out there who very much want to be idolized by their employees and, and want to have the accolades sent forward to them from their employees. Um, so, you know, it's it's very tricky with transference. Once you start finding yourself in a transference situation, I'm going to talk about a time that, that I actually encountered that. Um, it, it's you lose you're not objective anymore it's not about you it's about the other person or it becomes about the other organization that very easily leads to you're putting the resources in then of 60 80 whatever hours a week and other resources to to possibly get this this pat on the back or just to to be associated with this organization so um i i i think it's you know there there's a fine line between, um, you know, respecting a superior or respecting somebody, you know, that, that you, that you work with, um, and also being, being skeptical, skeptical, because I mean, um, if, if you truly, truly, let's think about it. If you truly respect your, your boss and the organization and you have an idea or you see something that is, that is not contributing or maybe inhibiting the efficiency of the organization, or you just want to propose an idea out there, um, you want a boss or an organization that's going to be approachable to putting that that idea forward. Um, so sometimes, and sometimes you have to be, let's let's be honest, I mean, you always have to look out for your own best interests. You have to be skeptical of what the organization is doing, or maybe even, you know, skeptical of some global, you know, policy acts that might be happening that might be affecting the field that you work in. And, you know, looking out for yourself and saying, ah, I need to be, I need to be aware of this versus just saying, ah, things will just work out. You know, I'm like, my boss knows what he or she is doing and the company knows what it's doing. So like, everything's going to be fine. I don't even need to concern myself with this. I'm giving my positive transference forward. I'm vesting it into the company. So I'll, I'll talk later about how something like that happened with uh, the Ford Motor Company and what, what that actually looked like. So, um, I, so when I took an administrative position um, a few years ago, uh, one of the things I did is I, I was very enamored by the organization and, you know, where it was, was located. Um, there was just a kind of a lot of prestige that, that was affiliated in, in the field with this organization. And that wouldn't be unlike today. I mean, if somebody says, I work for Google, um, that, you know, it's going to be like, whoa, you work for Google. 
and and people know that Google, you know, is a uh, very employee friendly organization. Uh, you know, the company's growing, um, very dynamic. So, I mean, that's the, that's going to have a little bit of an awe to it of like, okay, you know, wow, you work for 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 Google. And I kind of had I had something kind of like that. Um, but what I was what I was doing is I was very very much enamored. I, I gave this positive transference to the to this organization. Um, and it, I, I, I did it, you know, so, so easily because of the way that this organization projected. Um, and I didn't really look at how I fit into that organization. And, and I was just, I just wanted to be a part of it. That was so important to me to be a part of this organization. And so once I was able to be a part of it, um, I would do, you know, anything I could to, to make sure I, I kept being a part of that organization. And I didn't really have, um, a good, uh, what I would call member check. So I'm going to tell you what a member check is. A member check is when you, and I'm telling you, do this right now. You find your best friends or your family members. I mean, not like your maybe immediate family members, maybe some people that don't, don't, you know, see you all the time who can, uh, you know, how you see someone, you know, like once every two months or something. And you can, you can kind of gauge like if they've changed versus like if you see them every day, you're not going to, you're not going to pick up on those subtle, those subtle changes. But, um, either a family member that doesn't see you all the time that you trust or, just, you know, friends of yours and, and do what's called the member check. And this is, this is very much a part of research. Okay. And a member check is when you have somebody else who knows you and knows the environment that you're working in. So they have some knowledge of that. Um, and, and basically they, you, you talk to them about what you're perceiving. So in research, it might be like, this is what I'm finding, like on, on these research findings, and this is going to be my approach and stuff. And the member check might be somebody saying, you know what? Um, I think here, here's where I think you're on. Here's where I think, you know, you're, you're, you're going down the wrong course on, on this. And they're very honest with you. So the member check is someone is, is going to be very honest, like brutally honest with you because you want that. You want to be able to, to, change direction or at least consider that. I mean, it's not like you're, you're going to listen to them and say, oh, okay, yes. And then you'll change. You're going to listen, process and say, okay, I value this person and their opinion, and maybe it's going to inform how I'm going to do this and I'm going to change it. But, um, it's, it's that feedback. It's, it's the feedback that you get because a lot of us do not, first of all, take time for introspection. We don't do that. Um, the other is we don't have a very good process for our, our own reflection. So for me, for example, in this position that I was in, in this, this prestigious, you know, organization, uh, you know, I, I was getting a lot of signals. Uh, I was, I was putting on, on weight. I was, I was sick a lot. I mean, more than I had been in my life, you know, I'm ending up going to urgent care. Um, I'm, I'm getting, you know, illnesses that aren't going away. Um, anxiety, you know, I'm not sleeping at night, you know, I'm logging in and I'm going through pounding through emails and pounding through, you know, additional paperwork and things at home and, and just, um, putting in time and time and time. And what's happening is I'm just getting sicker and sicker and, and, and more burned out. Um, and it, 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 and not realizing though, of, of what's really happening. Like those symptoms are there, but the overwhelming thing is I have that positive transference of, I, I am so transferred into wanting to be a part of that organization and validate it by being a part of that organization, by, by wearing the apparel associated with that organization, being able to, to have that business card with that organization. Um, I really, uh, lost the ability to, um, do introspection or reflection. And then I didn't have a member check. I didn't have somebody who could come to me and, and even if they knew I might be upset and say, you know what, you're not happy. Um, you haven't been happy for a while. Here's, here's what I think, you know, is, is going on. Here's how you're presenting. Here are some things, um, to consider, to think about, and then, you know, leave it in your wheelhouse. You know, I would never tell anybody what to do. Um, but as a member check myself, you know, sometimes I've, I've reflected back to, you know, people what, what my observations are. Um, so, it, and of course, I mean, we all have obligations to put food on the table. So it's not like you can just, you know, up and, and leave a job. But I, I, I think you can also, you know, start to say, yeah, you know what? Um, maybe there's, 
this isn't what I thought it was, um, for me and I need to, I need to go in a different direction. So, um, but anyway, that I, I think positive transference, uh, can, can be so strong and, and it, it just can be, it can obscure your discretion. So have that member check. And here's what my member, the person who did my member check, <laughs> this is what they told me. Okay. So, um, you know, we're meeting. It, it, and basically this person says, you know what? And I said, be pr- brutally honest with me. I said, first of all, let me tell you what I'm feeling. Like I, I'm, I'm feeling, I, I'm not able to maintain my health. Like there's always the, the issues just kind of keep growing in, in the position. Um, I feel like I'm, I'm implementing that I'm not innovating. I think that's a big, that's a big thing to be aware of. And that really, you know, I'm seeking out the, the, the prestige of being affiliated with this organization or the praise of, of being affiliated with this organization. Not that I didn't do a good job, but, you know, I definitely, um, you know, you know, did a good job and, and brought value to the organization. Um, so what this person told me was, you know what, Dave, your emails, that you, the emails you send out, just your regular emails, not work emails, just regular emails, like they are super negative. <laughs> you, you, your emails are toxic. You're angry about something. You're upset about something. You can point out 10 different things of whatever it could be, whether, you know, the, this winter is too long, um, but it, you know, politics, uh, w- whatever it is, you can take it at, in, um, you know, you, you, you can, you can add a negative spin to it. Okay. Um, and, and that's what you're doing. So, you know, getting emails for you, they're kind of tiring because there isn't, there isn't a sunny side to them. I'm like, whoa, but that's what I wanted to hear. And, and that's what you want from a member check. I wanted to hear that. Um, and you know, and so you, you know, it takes a while. You got to process like what people say. And then it's like, just go back and read some things, like read the emails that you're sending. And also like some people I would talk to on the phone and, and they would say, yeah, you know, like your number would come up and it'd be like, uh, you know, not, not, you know, just knew it was going to be a discussion that was, that was going to pretty quickly roll around, um, just, you know, some of the frustrations and unhappiness, um, you're, you're having. Um, so it's like, that's what the member check is, is going to tell you. Um, so use your, use your member check to make sure that your transference, your positive transference, your, your, doesn't get out of hand to the point where you're doing anything, you know, to, to stay affiliated with that organization, that club, you know, whatever it might be. So, um, you know, from a safety, um, uh, from a safety standpoint, you know, that's, that's very important now for physical safety. I mean, my well being, my health, um, you know, and, and then also just, you know, your psychological safety, you know, it, it just grind, it, it grinds you down. So, you know, I think those have very relevant safety ties, you know, so, um, I'm going to talk about a situation, um, actually where the having, having this sense of, of this complete, um, transference into an organization, uh, proved deadly. And it was 1958. It was, um, a fire broke out at Our Lady of the Angel School in Chicago, Illinois. So the teachers, uh, so it, it killed, I believe, 92 students and, and some of the nuns who were teachers. Um, uh, the, the teachers had looked in vain for the school principal, were so much, um, enamored, um, uh, had given so much transference, positive transference to the school principal that they weren't going to evacuate the building or do these things unless like they had the approval of, of this principal because, you know, this is how the system went. Even though like their best interest, their gut feeling obvious would have, obviously would have been, you know, we see smoke, um, coming out through under the doors and we can smell the smoke and all of that, that we need to evacuate the building and, and do all that needs to happen. No, it was, there was so much positive transference, so much vertical in this organization that it, it really inhibited the individual's ability to um, act in the best interest of self and others. So they were seeking out like that top person to make sure it was going to be okay with them, um, that they weren't going to be upset if, if they, you know, 
um, evacuated this building. So, um, which ended up, you know, costing time and there were some other issues with this, but whoa. So, but that happens, you know, um, I don't want to be yelled at for my principal because of evacuating this building. That was one factor along with others, but that's an example. Um, so we talked about that article, uh, written by Mr. Jacob, um, uh, McCoby, um, so the transference dynamic is most likely to be out of control during periods of organizational stress. This is, this is, uh, per the author. So, um, and yes and no. Okay. So his yes part to that is saying, if let's, let's give an example. When I was working in, um, a school district and in Wisconsin, Act 10 passed, which meant that, uh, the schools would no longer be able to have have unions and also that, that, uh, teachers would be paying uh, a portion of their retirement. And so, I mean, it was a very, uh, it was a time when tens of thousands of, of people marched upon the, the state capitol. But I remember teachers during that time, and I was an administrator, I remember teachers at that time actually crying, like just uh, visibly shaking and crying. And it was, and they were doing that, um, because they were so, uncertain of what was going on, but they had given power the transference. Okay. They, they had, they had given transference into the, the head person and then also into the school board. And that's where their transference was. So they, they waited uh, for a, a, a all staff um, in the, the performing arts center, the school board and, and the leader of the school to come out and basically say, you know, we're committed to, you know, making sure that we treat employees fairly and, and everything that they could say. But the reality was, um, there was, it, this was all beyond their control. This was, this was at a state level. So, um, but once people heard that, you know, that they had given this positive transference into, into this leader and then also into this board, um, without like that, you know, completely irrational. I mean, the rational side, the being rational would say, it doesn't matter what they say. They're they're not in control of this. This is being passed at a, at a state level. They're, they they are they are now just actors, agents in this process. So they're going to have to carry this out, however the state dictates it. But this irrational thing of of needing someone. So it's just like if you're a, a kid, you know, you're five six years old and you scrape your knee and and you need someone to tell you it's going to be you know okay, um, or something to that effect, and. Believe it or not, I mean that's what happens. That's that's what happens. So it was very interesting for me to to see that unfold. So you know, McCoby talks about the transference dynamic is most likely to get out of control during periods of organizational stress. So, so again, yes and no. Um, in my book coming out, uh, Lessons of Lower Manhattan, organizational um, stress. So when you had the rescue of five hundred thousand people in nine hours by boats. Um, from fishing boats to leisure boats to um, some Coast Guard cutters to, uh, you know, a couple Navy boats. But, I mean, all these types of different, you know, um, actors, tools, you know, things like that that were involved. Um, and a, a lot of chaos, a lot of turbulence. Um, but actually out of that created some type of an organizational structure and um, – Something, and I'm talking um, with a researcher um, uh, ab about this, uh, who's dedicated, you know, 40 years to studying chaos theory and also turbulence theory. And, and what he has mentioned is, you know what? Actually, once you have turbulence, and and I don't know the finite difference between the turbulence and chaos, but um, once you actually have more chaos introduced into a system, you have more options that become apparent. And the mind is very good at picking up these options. So it's it's things that the, the turbulence itself, the chaos, starts to create some uh, opportunities for you. So it's one of those things, um, you know, it, it, it's like if, if you're um, outside and, you know, it, you're in a heavy rain, you know, um, but all of a sudden, you know, what if, what if, you know, it gets more turbulent and storm and um, blows open a, a, a door somewhere? Well, now you can go into that, that building. So just kind of a weird thing of like the more chaos that's in, introduced or whatever um, might actually provide opportunities within that, that context and situation for you to um, seek safety and seek a safe option, just keeping your heuristics open. So, 
Um, let us talk about um, doubt and stress. So the article identifies doubt and stress as triggers for transference. And I talked about that already, you know, with, with the school employees who are like, well, what is my contract going to look like now? You know, for next year, the stress of what if I have a pay cut and, and you know, that that is going to trigger transference or basically saying um, they are looking then to invest um this positive, this, this trust into other people to handle this, that they perceive have the ability to, to do this or who are going to look out for, for them. And again, um, what you need to do during those situations, I believe, I very much believe this and, and we'll write about this is you need to, um, analyze your, yourself and, and th your own strengths and the ways that you're going to deal with this doubt and stress independent of these other systems, which are out there or independent of other people, uh, because ultimately the, the, you're going to be able to help yourself more than anyone else. Um, and if you are transferring, you know, you're triggering this transference. So, you know, if we just look at it, if, if things become uneasy, um, it, in going back through, you know, history, once, you know, things start to become uneasy in a um, political climate or, you know, with a, a, a war climate, it's pretty easy to get people to go along um, and to transfer their trust into this greater organization or, or into a person. Um, it's easier to do that during times of, of doubt and stress and uneasiness. Um, you know, if the stock market all of a sudden drops by 2000 points and, and doubt and stress enters, you know, your life, um, you know, you're, you're going to, you know, transfer this, this trust into the federal reserve and the government when really it's like, I should be looking at my own, um, resources, my own lines of income, the assets that I have. Um, if I'm, how do I take care of, of my own fiscal well-being and, and just also, you know, is this now an opportunity for me to learn how to pick up a skill or a trade so I can, you know, I don't have to take my car in for an oil change. I can learn that on my own. So, I mean, it's that whole difference from introspection and reflection to just jumping to transference of saying, I'm going to find the superhero person to fix this for me. Um, you know, the Ben Bernanke, the, the Janet Yellen, whatever it might be. So, um, again, when you have that feeling of transference of looking outside of you, look back inside of you. You look at yourself, you look at your own skill set. How can you strengthen your skill set? For example, um, you know, things like that. How can you manage your own dollars versus again, someone out there is going to fix it for me. There's the person. I'm trusting them. Now I'm okay. Like I've, I've given that. And that's maybe because when you're raised, um, if something broke possibly, you know, something, you know, broke down on your bike, you know, your, your chain broke or something on your bike, you know, a parent would, would take the bike and, and get a new chain put on it or something like that. So, I mean, it goes back to things like early on, you see people who were very self-sufficient as kids uh, who did handle a lot of these things on their own, uh, when doubt and stress hits them later in life, things like what I just talked about, like that stock market drop, they're less likely to jump to this transference versus like looking at what can I do myself to better position my, you know, my finances and my own skill set to weather this. So, um, <laughs> doubt and stress. Yeah. It triggers transference. It also, though, there's another part of this. It wasn't mentioned. I think it, it triggers people want information. People want information. So the, I covered this in a podcast, the Joseph Jakubowski manhunt in Wisconsin uh, a couple months ago. Uh, he, you know, he broke in, stole a number of firearms, wrote a manifesto to an anti-government uh, manifesto, sent it to uh, President Trump. Um, and there was a manhunt for, you know, like about 10 days for him. But as I read through the Twitter posts, you know, the hashtag like Jakubowski and so forth, um, about one third of the Twitter posts, it was just people that wanted information. That's what they wanted. They just wanted to know like, okay, like who's all searching for this guy? Where are they searching? What about him? Where did he go to school? You know, like, you know, are there any more characteristics about him that you can share in case I happen to see him? <laughs> I mean, there wasn't a lot shared. So it was just people that were information 
seeking. And I think doubt and stress also brings about that information seeking. It's the fear of the unknown. I don't know if even if it's the fear of the unknown, it's just, you know, that that unknown leaves this void or this craving. And and so bring forward information to people. Um, and even if you say, like, this is what I know um, and, and, you know, this is it, then, hey, you know, like, that's that's fine. Um, but again, doubt and stress, you know, it triggers that transference. Yes, but I think it also puts people where they want information. And then when the mainstream media is not giving them information, which in this Jakubowski thing, there wasn't a lot coming out at all. Um, and it, it really was this void of information that was, was getting people anxious. So, um, dun, dun, dun. Like maybe that was kind of obvious to say, but, um, it is, it is much better. To, for someone to have transference, um, even, even if it's a very remote hope, okay, like transference of there is, you know, there's a division of, you know, Americans that I, I, I am convinced, you know, is, is 20 miles away. And this transference of I'm giving all of my trust to this division, which may or may not be out there. Um, and to hold that hope and then to, to give up. Victor Frankl would say once people would give up and he'd see the blank stare and they wouldn't respond. That was horrifying, absolutely horrifying. So it is better to obviously, um, subscribe to some kind of, of hope, even if it's a rash, even if it's irrational and until a situation like that, uh, like that kind of, um, you know, resolves, you know, like the camp is liberated. So, um, Let's talk. Oh, I, you know, I think something really interesting happened in the 9-11 boat rescue. So September 11, 2001, again, you have boats rescuing 500,000 people from lower Manhattan. And you had blocks deep of people waiting to get to the harbor line, you know, the shoreline to, to be rescued. And these people weren't pushing each other. They're not trampling each other, not crushing each other. It's not like after some crazy football game where people are you know, running out trying to storm the field and people get crushed and killed. Um, it was orderly. So why would it be orderly when planes have crashed into the Twin Towers? You don't know if the situation is, is, is done. I mean, that this is still a dynamic situation. You don't know if the harbor's been mined. You know, the bridges are closed because they don't know if the bridges have... Um, you know, have, have been laced with explosives. So, you know, you are completely, you are completely at the mercy of whatever is happening in that Harbor, uh, for you to get off of that Island. So here's what I think happened. I, I've, I've studied this for a while and I'm going to run this past a couple other researchers of why was this not a mob mentality? Why did people not panic? You know, certainly people were anxious, but why did people not panic? And I believe it was positive transference. Okay. Let's think about it. In 2001, probably most of the people that would have been in lower Manhattan, you know, that, that would have been working in lower Manhattan and there were other people, but I mean, let's say you're in your thirties and forties. In 2001, if you're in your thirties and forties, you would have grown up during the Cold War. So the Soviet Union, you know, the United States military is keeping us safe from the Soviet Union. So you would have had some indoctrination of, you know, positive experience um, with with the military. Uh, even, you know, like the military is here to protect us. The military is here to serve our best interests, to keep us safe. If you see, and, and not, I, and I'm just saying, but let, let's say that you see there's 300 boats out there and, and one is a Coast Guard, you know, cutter and, and one is a naval um, ship that the transference is going to go out to saying, you know, oh, this, this is, this is being a, this is a military or Coast Guard operation. They know what they're doing. Um, they're going to rescue us. This is all, you know, being uh, orderly assembled and I'm going to get off and, and I just have to wait. I mean, this, this line will just keep moving forward. I just need to wait. But yeah, because they're out there, like I can see that Coast Guard, that, that Coast Guard cutter, you know, which can, can take on what, maybe 40 people out of you know, 500,000 people you're rescuing. But, um, but all of a sudden it changes. It's this positive transference that happens because people in the past, what have they done? What, what have they seen? They've seen, you know, military positively project it. Um, and they have been, you know, had been 
told, you know, we have to stay vigilant. We're keeping you safe from the Soviet Union. So this, this is the era that these people were raised in, um, you know, which would have been my era. And, and so they're projecting this, this forward. They're doing this positive, this, this positive transference. So it's fascinating because I'm not sure that would happen today. I'm not sure that would happen. You can only speculate. Um, and you'd have two scenarios that you'd have to look at, um, today. And one scenario would be like, if there was never a September 11, 2001, and there was only like a September 11th, 2017, um, how would people react? Because, um, you know, people would probably, you know, have not gone through that cold war experience. You have much, you know, many fewer people that have gone through that. Um, the other, um, you know, part of that is if, if you had a scenario where something happened now, people would probably pattern back to knowing that there was, uh, you know, that there, there were all these rescues, um, that, that happened on 9-11 and they would expect that that would replicate again for whatever, you know, terrorist attack that there would be. So, you know, one, either of those two scenarios, um, would, would come into play. But I do think the reason there was not this, the, this crazy mob mentality pushing over each other to get up to the shoreline and, and fights breaking out and just sheer panic, um, was because of this positive transference that happened, um, because of what was in the harbor, you know, the, the visible, you know, Coast Guard cutter. Um, or, you know, cutters and, and a few naval ships, which represented, you know, in total of this rescue, 500,000 people, you know, maybe represented a few thousand people and that was it. And the rational side of any of us, I mean, if we, if we think about the rational side of being, um, a block deep, it, 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 you know, you know, they, they haven't prepared for this. I mean, nobody has drilled for this. This has not been a contingency of how to evacuate 500,000 people off of lower Manhattan. It's not been done previously in history. I mean, there were boat rescues at Dunkirk in 1940, Saigon in 1975, but nothing to this scale. Um, so, you know, rationally, if you thought about it, you'd be like, there's no way this is, this is going off of some, predetermined script or that they've worked together or that there's really an instant command system in place here that's dictating this. So what's going out there in the water is, is, is gotta be chaotic and, and, and all of that actually, which it wasn't, which was surprising, but, um, but the rational thinker I think would have, would have been much more panicky than the irrational thinker who was willing to give up because of, of this, this, the stressful event was, was able to look and to default and to throw out that positive transference of saying, no, I was raised as a kid, you know, the, the, and, and the military protected us from the Soviets. This is kind of a military operation. They're protecting me. They're acting in my best interest now. That's all I need to know. This will work out. Um, you're still anxious, but this will work out. And I will be writing about that, by the way. Um, so... Uh, dun, 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 dun. Let us talk about um, about the leadership. Okay, so in the leadership today, especially in schools, for example, I mean, a school principal, superintendent, two, three years, and then you're gone if you last that long. Teachers uh, turnover is accelerating also. So you, you don't have these institutions where people are there for decades and you can have then what's called distributed leadership coming down through these organizations or, or, or people at different levels are given opportunities to lead projects, to, to lead people. And, and you kind of have these leaders who emerge through these experiences that takes time. It's called distributed le leadership. And it also, you know, is in the tools that people are using, um, you know, like in a school, it might be, you know, part of flip charts that are developed and people are used to, to the flips that charts, um, that they're used to practicing drills, things like that. But again, if you have turnover and new people, new actors into this, um, it, it, it completely, um, it, it's a completely different environment now. So this whole thing of distributed leadership is, is kind of out the door. And, and I'll talk about that sometime in a podcast in, in more detail, because there's people who argue that we still have, uh, distributed leadership models and that you can still put these into systems. And I'm saying, I, it's not the way that it works anymore. Um, especially with millennial, uh, the millennials, you know, they're, they're changing jobs at a very frequent pace, you know, keeping their options open. Um, 
they prefer to work um, independently for the most part. They, you know, like work from home, work from a laptop somewhere. Um, and so one of those things, too, of, you know, like our organization needs to change. We need to be less vertical because, um, you know, for the millennials, we want to do, you know, team building and have them work in teams. And the reality is, no, like a lot of millennials have not worked in teams. I mean, they're they're they will work individually if you put here's what your here's what I need you to do then you can do it from home or do it from where you want and and that's what they want that's what they want um you know like my generation let's think about this in, in years ago i mean you're going and it's a summer and you're playing sandlot ball i mean you had a lot of horizontal um collaboration and and you know kind of sifting out who who automatically became you know the leaders of different groups like the you know different baseball teams you almost kind of defaulted always to like the older kids but um or it might be just the kid who's you know a couple of kids are really good or whatever it is but but he actually probably did more of that like back when i was growing up um but the millennials i mean and a lot of stuff is it's the play dates i mean things have been planned out for them um the playground equipment you know is is not very adventurous today you're not letting kids um you know go off and and wonder and explore you know from the 1990s on um you know you and plus i mean they're connected via via social networks or whatever so somebody always knows where they are so i'm just saying th this this thought of of leadership we need to change leadership um, because, uh, people, this whole thing of transference right now with, with, you know, millennials, they're not going to, to, to want to, um, you know, give this vesting to bosses and things like that. They, they just want kind of the project and work on it. And, and they'll, they'll work together, you know, with each other. It's like, well, whoa, 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 whoa. They'll, they'll, they're more individual than what you think. Probably more individual than any, um, group of, 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 workers we've ever had i mean they're, they're they're more individual so i'm saying with that you know that this whole transference thing um I, I i don't think you know trying to push down and flatten into horizontal is is going to to do any good you know versus doing that versus vertical if anything i think vertical probably works better um, because then they, they know who their point people are to contact and to get their things into but they're they're going to work very independently. But let's go. 1981 to 2001, Jack Welch was the CEO of General Electric. Jack Welch. So long time for a tenure for a CEO, right? 20 years. So um, the author of the article, uh, Mr. McCoby, felt that employees transferred their childhood feelings onto Jack Welch, even though they had never met him. They idolized him. They would do anything for Jack Welch to be a part of GE during 1981 and 2001, which meant, you know, coming in early, staying late, taking work home, um, that they always spoke positively, you know, of, uh, there's exceptions, but I mean, it's like, I, Jack Welch, I mean, he's an icon, he's an industrial icon, and he's been here, you know, for, for so long. So people had this, this vesting and, and it was, um, again, you know, that they wanted this approval, um, and and by working for this company and being able to say, being able to say, hey, you know, someone says, well, tell me, tell me about yourself. What 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 is this person, 1981 to 2001, um, works for General Electric? What are they saying? They're saying, I work for General Electric. That's what they're saying when you say, T tell me about yourself. I work for General Electric. Uh, I'm an engineer with General Electric. Um, what they're not saying. Because that is that is their transference. That's their identity. They're laminated to General Electric. They're laminated to to um, Jack Welch, or you know, like um, you know, J Jack Welch is is my is my CEO. Like I'm, I'm he's the greatest, and I am working. In, you know, and you're defending even if you don't know really anything about Jack Welch other than he is leading your company and in, in GE. You know, pretty pretty. Pre pre Prestigious, right? From 1981 to 2001. Um, so, um, so yeah, just, just this crazy thing. So anyways, transfer the, the article saying this transfer these childhood feelings of like needing that, that adult figure to, to validate you and, and looking at this Jack Welch of, of this. So you're, you're, you're transferring at, and you're feeling validated. So these are people who put in all of this time. And back then, you know, in 81, if you're starting there, you know, realistically, yeah, you, you probably could work a whole career there. But I mean, that's not the way things are anymore. So, um, just, just really, really crazy stuff, how transference can, can 
you, you get laminated to it. Again, someone asks you, you know, tell me about yourself. I work for GE. My boss is, you know, Jack, Jack, well, he's, he's the head of the, of the company and, you know, it's General Electric. And, and, um, instead of saying like, um, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm married. You know, I have, uh, I have, uh, three children, two girls and a boy. And, um, you know, we, we love to do, uh, things outdoors and, uh, um, you know, we like to, um, in winter, uh, go up, go up north and, and kind of check out, you know, like, I mean, things like this, like those types of things where you, where you center on family and, and, or you center on, you know, like, Hey, like, you know, I, I love, tell me about yourself. Like, I, I love biking. Like I, I love bike treks. So, you know, as soon as it warms up, like I'm, I'm out there, I'm really, you know, into, into biking and, and you're not using this, this, this transference to define yourself. You're defining yourself through, you know, through you or, or your, your family, that inner, that inner circle, it's not laminated to like, and it, you know, it's, it's weird. Cause what was it? it is, I don't know, Boeing or, or some place where a number of engineers, you know, had, 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 they were laid off and some completed suicide because like, as soon as they were not an engineer for that company that they couldn't say, I'm an engineer with, um, I work for this. As soon as they couldn't do that, um, they, they lost their purpose. They lost their agency. Their agency had been transferred. They had, had become defined and laminated by having that job title. And the moment they didn't have that anymore, boom, it was over. And you'll see this sometimes with people that retire. As soon as they give up that position that really became their identity, uh, they lose it. You know, they, they, they just can't handle it. So, um, it, you know, so like the modern day equivalent of GE would be like someone saying, I work for Google. But, you know, the people that work for Google, um, you know, that's a number of them have, you know, pretty well-rounded lives. And I know that from a, from talking specifically to someone who works at, at Google um, of the interest of his his peers and things that they do. And I think Google fosters that as a company. But certainly, um, if you work for Google, there's going to be a number of people say, I work for Google because, I mean, there there is there is an aura, you know, that that is that is with that, um, which is which is obviously OK and to, to do that and things like that. But it's it's like, do you say that Um what if you say like, you know, I love astronomy and by the way, you know, I, I work for Google and my schedule is flexible. So I have, I have times to, you know, when, when there's certain star patterns in the sky, I can change my schedule so I can, I can, you know, stay up a little later at, at night and then go in a little bit later to work. And it's really a cool thing. So, you know, I'm just sorry, those little, those little things. And how do you define yourself out right now? Like if somebody asked you like to tell me about yourself, what are the first three things you're saying? And if you're starting right off with work, you have given up too much transference. You have given up too, tra too much transference. You need introspection, reflection. You need a member check because that is not what you do. Okay. If this is what you're doing, that's bad. That's bad. Okay. Um, dun, 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 dun. You guys like this music, don't you? So, um, anyway, let's move, let's move, let's move, let's move, let's move. Um, dun, dun. Da, 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 da. Oh, okay. So I'm going to get into the part now of counter transference. We talked about transference, you know, so again, basically it's, it's like you vesting, putting, you know, into this, this, this other person, um, uh, or, or this other entity. And again, I'm saying you have to be really careful if you're doing that and at least be aware that you're doing that. At least have the awareness or someone to bring that awareness to you. And I think you can ask now that you've, you've, you've participated in, in this show. You can ask someone to say, are you seeing transference in me? Like, am I, you know, am, am I just like totally, um, you know, put the blinders on and, and willing to do whatever for like this organization or this group or this person or whatever. Um, I think that's really, that's really, um, that's really important. So anyway, counter transference. So it's when the follower projects his, his, okay. So the follower is projecting his past experience onto, onto the leaders. Um, but the leader then responds by projecting his or her past experiences back onto the follower. So let's think about this. Maybe there's a leader. And again, a lot of this is done at the subconscious level. And the leader is, is looking at a new employee and, and seeing some of the things that the employee is doing and, and is, is all of a sudden, you know, opening some doors, opportunities for that employee. And, wh and what's happening subconsciously? It's like, boy, you know, that, that employee reminds me of me when I was young. 
like, you know, I was, I was innovative, you know, um, and I want this person to, to have some opportunities to be innovative. And again, we talked about being an innovator and not an implementer. An implementer, I mean, is someone who just carries out things. An innovator is, is someone that creates things. So maybe this, this person is, is getting all the, these uh, opportunities, um, which are being created for them just because they remind this person of what they were like when they were young. Or maybe, um, you know, that they, they have mannerisms that remind them of somebody that they worked with who was an excellent colleague. Um, I mean, it could be, you know, just things like that, 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 that have those, that, that cause that counter transference. Um, so that, that definitely happens too. And I think sometimes that counter transference, um, you know, needs, that needs to be checked. Other people can probably see it, um, and be like, why is, it seems like this person is getting a lot of breaks here. <laughs> Let's deal with that. Um, and it, it can be the case of this counter-transference of, of you're, you're just wanting that person to succeed because in the past, you know, you have memories from the past that they're reminding you of, you know, they're, they're, they're bringing these forward. And, and again, so if you're in that leadership role versus even, you know, the employee role or le leadership role, you need a member check and someone saying, Hey, you know, like, but given Terry, like a lot of breaks on this, on this project, um, or, or like, um, you know, some professional development, but, um, Terry hasn't been here that long. So, but some of these other people have, um, so why aren't these people getting the professional development? And, and it's like, you, you probably don't realize it until it's like, Oh, Oh yeah. Like, you know, um, it, those things are, those things are hard to parse out. So, but anyway, this whole counter transference, um, you know, it, it can be as subtle as if someone reminds you has this positive. It can also be negative. It can be like a great employee, but guess what? Like they they dress similar to someone who really um, you know rubbed you the the wrong way at at, at work, or or just a, a relative, or even like a haircut, or their the tone of their voice, or something that makes this association, and it, it just brings out this 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 negative transference from you. Um, so it is those types of things where you just need to, to have this, this hyper awareness. You might say that doesn't happen. Yeah. It happens all the time. And it's happened. It, it, it probably happened actually today, you know, at some level or in this past week, certainly in some minute aspect that happened to you. So really think about it. Be aware. Um, be in the moment and, and process, you know, process that. Be aware of counter transference because it is, it is there. Um, you know, and it's like a coach, you know, who just, you know, keeps putting the same player in the game, even though that player is struggling or it's, it's a mismatch because when that coach was young and that coach was playing, the coach, you know, could see the grit and could work, you know, had a situation where, you know, felt he worked through this and this person's going to work through it too. And everyone in the, in the stands like, whoa, 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 whoa. And that person is just, they, they, it's not working out. This isn't their day. They got to get them out and you got to get somebody else in. So, um. And, and you end up costing the organization then, costing the team, costing the organization. So, um, dun, dun, dun. youth give up some of their own views and embrace views of parents, adult figures as unquestionably correct. So I'll talk about this, uh, when I interview, uh, Aaron, Aaron Clary, because it's relevant to his, his work. Um, but it is where, you know, youth will, Embrace. So if their parents have, you know, certain religious belief, if the parent, um, has a certain bias, um, the, the child will, will take that on. They'll embrace that view of the parent versus fostering their own view and debate for themselves. Uh, I had, uh, honestly, I did not own a vehicle with a sunroof until I was in my forties. And the, the reason I didn't is because I had always been told by my mom, always been told by my mom, sunroofs leak. They always leak unconditional. It's a rule of sunroofs. So I didn't get a sunroof. I never, I, I, I just was, it was a rule out. Like you check the box on what you want on a car sunroof, not checked. Why? Because it leaks. Well, obviously, I mean, if you're rational, you're going to know that, um, millions of vehicles are made with sunroofs and they wouldn't be making millions of vehicles with sunroof if every sunroof leaked. And my sunroof on my vehicle, which I owned for, I don't know, eight years, never leaked once. And it was great. I loved, I loved the sunroof. So, but it was one of those things that had been that transference because I believe that, you know, my, my mom, you know, my parents knew what they were doing, like when they had bought cars and stuff like that. And, and they, they knew this. So it's like, 
okay, it, it just became something I transferred and it wasn't anything I critically really thought about, which is just crazy, right? Crazy. So, um, I, I'm going to give, uh, another example back to when, how, you know, you define yourself by the company. In the 1930s, okay, the Ford Motor Company would give out pins, lapel pins, and they would have the Ford, you know, logo and all that. And people would wear those. Those weren't for work. You would wear those around the community to then identify yourself as, I work for Ford. This is a badge of honor. See this? I work for Ford. You'd wear it to church. You'd wear it shopping. All right? You'd wear it when you go out eating. I work for Ford. And that was, again, you know, that, that meant something. It was like, it was proud. I mean, I'm, here it is. Look at it. This is, this is Ford. I work for Ford. Um, so yes, that person, you know, well, you don't they already have it out there. What do you do? Tell me about yourself. I work for Ford. That's what they're saying. They're, they're just completely giving up their transference into this, this, this company and to, you know, to Henry Ford and, and, and just, you know, this, his sons, Ford, Ford, Ford. What is it? It's Ford. You can go on eBay. Go on eBay. You can find the Ford pins. You can still buy them. But that's what people would do is they would wear those. They would wear those all around. It could be a family gathering. It could be a picnic, whatever. You had your Ford pin on. So, yeah. But that kind of transference then takes away the questioning, the skepticism, too, and and then also identifying, is this really you know right for, for me? I think there's loyalty. I think all of that's there, too. But you can see where this transference starts to come in. If the company's looking out for me, it's going to look out for my kids like it'll be there forever. Well, no, no, it's not the case. You look out for yourself first. Um, and just closing here, um, make sure... Be aware, you know, that uh, what the difference between whether you're in the role of an implementer versus an innovator, sometimes people that uh, are very much into um, transference become the the implementers and not the innovators. They, they, they will do whatever's told of them so they can can feel like they're um, satisfying that that superior and and that is meeting this need for transference of getting you know I, I'm making this person happy because I'm carrying this out or whatever um, yet the person really you know you want to be an innovator and you'll see that this transference also happens on this weird level right now of social media this 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 weird level of people are giving transference into social media like transference of validation into Facebook so their transference is it's the same thing if they get their paper back when they're in elementary school and it has the smiley face on it with the A, you know, written on it by the teacher and the good job or the sticker. Um, and what that is now, what that is, is that is that like on Facebook or that someone responds with a good job, but it's that like button on Facebook that's something they've posted. And people give that transference, that positive transference into the, this, the cyber, the cyber social world. Um, and they laminate to that. So personally for me, I feel I've delaminated from all of those, those work associations. Um, I don't describe myself in terms of work anymore. Um, and I feel like it has been a phenomenal weight lifted off of my shoulders. Um, and looking back, though, I can see how easy it is for that to to happen. I know what I'm good at. I, I you know, in biking and, and I, you know, like I can tell you um, later tonight, you know, my daughter and I will, will practice baseball outside or, or softball. Like uh, it's going to be fun. And I, I gave my other daughter this really cool like fidget spinner. And and, um, you know, we're looking forward to going as a family when the, the there's a certain movie that's going to be coming out. I mean, so so these are all things, you know. Um, but it's not like here, you know, this is work or like, I'm going to just, you know, this is my book. And, and these are all things you know, it's, it's cool. I mean, these are all things, but that's not how I'm defining myself out. These are things, those are things that I do. I haven't given, I haven't given transference into any of those things. Um, so I'm not tied if any of those things would happen to, um, to happen to change or stress would be introduced in any of those. I could objectively handle those by identifying myself you know, my own strengths, my own weaknesses, um, how to scaffold um, where I'm at to to better uh, weather any storms uh, versus this transference of of looking out for the answers, you know, versus versus looking in. So that's all. That's all I have for today on the safety doc. Again, um, transference and counter transference. Be aware of it. I hope the show was was helpful for you. Have a great day.
I am David, the Safety Doc. I will see you next week.